All right, we're good to go. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our reInvent 2021 recap live stream event. That's quite a mouthful, and it doesn't just stop there. It is not just regular recap event, which is boring rehashing of all the announcements made at last year's reInvent, but instead wanted to do things a little bit differently. And therefore, we decided to um, brand this session as a developer's perspective on reInvent 2021, or to be more precise, a cloud native development perspective on reInvent. So we do talk about reInvent 2021, we do talk about some of the announcements, uh, but we regard all of this through the lens of a developer, and therefore it's not your typical uh, recap, but it is still a recap. Now, before we start, it's time to introduce our speakers. And since I'm already talking, uh, let me kick off the round of introductions first. My name is Bert Edman. I'm the VP Technology of Luminous. I've been with the company for over 10 years now. Um, uh, I'm a regular speaker in the conference circuit. I'm also a book author for uh, O'Reilly. And 2021 was my fourth uh, reInvent conference. Piet, um, give me up to you. Yes, um, hello everyone. Uh, I'll be speaking in a few minutes. My name is Piet van Dongen. I'm a cloud transformation consultant at Luminous. Uh, this was my second reInvent, at least a live one this year. Um, I'm one of the users of the uh, leaders of the Dutch AWS user group, and I'm also an AWS community builder. See you in a bit. Hello everyone. My name is Kemal Kulsen, and I'm a cloud architect for Luminous. I build cloud native applications and uh, AWS platforms, mostly. Bert? All right, thanks guys. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon, or thank you for watching this session in a replay somewhere, someday. Now let's have a look at the agenda for this afternoon and let's see what we have in store for you for the next 80 to 90 minutes or so. Uh, first off, we're gonna start with a little bit of general observations, just to give you a taste of what reInvent uh, was like. And we get you into the mood for this uh, presentation. And then we move over to the more serious parts, uh, which start with um, uh, me laying down this idea of AWS as the cloud native development platform, or how, do, uh, or how we see it at Luminous. And then uh, Pete will continue by talking about the ongoing evolution of serverless stuff uh, at AWS. And then we'll uh, uh, go over to how we think that events will drive our architecture for the years to come. Um, next, Kamal will take over and he will talk uh, a bit about how AWS is improving the developer experience uh, across their uh, portfolio of services. Finally, we're gonna end with a Q&A with all three of us uh, where we will be answering your questions. So if you have any questions uh, throughout the session, please either save them for the end or type them into the chat and um, maybe some of us not speaking can already start answering those questions right away. Uh, when we are nearing the end of the presentation, there will also be a chance to win some cool prizes uh, by uh, filling out a survey, uh, but uh, Kamal will explain more about this later on. Just make sure that you stay with us till the very end. Now, without further ado, uh, let's dive straight into the contents of this session. Now, I have to say that anticipation for last year's edition of reInvent was actually quite high. Maybe not so much for the real conference as it was for the sheer idea of traveling to a conference in the US again, after, well, about two years of being grounded. Uh, before the pandemic, I was attending and speaking at conferences all over the world, uh, but my last flight before COVID struck us was exactly to Las Vegas for reInvent 2019. So yes, attending a conference in person had been a while and this made me even enjoy the travel. As I mentioned in my introduction, uh, last year's reInvent was already my fourth reInvent, of which I have attended three in person. The 2020 edition of reInvent was, well, for obvious reasons, online only because of the pandemic. And before 2021, I also attended 2018 and 2019. We were really curious what we could expect from a hybrid edition of reInvent. AWS mentioned beforehand that there would be a hard limit of about 20,000 registrations, but from what I've read online, uh, they claimed there were about 27,000 unique attendees over the week and well over 100,000 people uh, uh, viewing the online part that were live streamed. And I'm not counting uh, the sessions which were published after the conference for replays. The setup of the venues 
uh, was a bit different than in previous years. So instead of having the conference locations spread all over the Las Vegas Strip, they were now concentrated and compacted more around the, the uh, area around the Venetian Hotel. So if you look at this picture, you see the Venetian is the middle purple building, and you see that there is a bunch of conference venues to the north and to the south of it, and uh, all in all, it was still quite a large uh, conference area, so um, uh, my, the step counter of my Apple Watch was still very happy with me. I believe that throughout the week, um, I spent about 120 kilometers walking, right? So that was quite an achievement. So you don't have to go to, a, to the gym these days, you just go to a conference. Um, from Luminous, we had four colleagues joining. You see them over there. Um, uh, so uh, four colleagues attended a uh, re-event in person. I think that would add up to about 40-ish or maybe 50 uh, total Dutch attendees uh, that uh, we've ran into throughout the week. But it could have been more. I don't have any exact uh, numbers on that. One good thing about having less people there was obviously that it was a lot easier to get into the keynotes, right? Uh, even if you show up fairly late. So especially compared to previous years, where you had to get in line to get into the keynote like hours in advance, if you could get into the room at all, because 2019, I think there were like over 60,000 people attending the conference. So getting into the keynote is actually really hard. Um, uh, in fact, getting into an overflow room for the keynote was even really hard. Uh, but this year we had no such problems. Um, Anticipation for reInvent was high in terms of uh, what tricks AWS uh, would have up its sleeve this time. I mean, not only did they have a recently newly appointed CEO, but we're also still in times of the pandemic, uh, which has yielded AWS with some impressive growth numbers. Then again, with so many AWS services already in the AWS portfolio, we didn't s really see any area up front where we were expecting any huge or, su or surprising announcements in. Their service portfolio seems fairly complete. So instead, we were basically expecting a lot of, well, now this works better with that kind of announcements. And I think, to be honest, a lot of those announcements actually were these kinds of announcements. In terms of the new CEO, which you see on the picture here, it was the first time that uh, Adam Salipski was to address the world at an AWS keynote. And reflecting about it, I would say that he did a pretty good job. It's probably not easy to fill the shoes of someone like Andy Jesse, uh, but he did a good job nevertheless. A first change that was clearly notable during his keynote was the absence of some competitor bashing. Uh, although they do it, I mean, reasonably classy and mostly subtle, uh, there used to be a bit of competitor bashing, especially in the first part uh, of the reInvent keynotes of the past, but not at this uh, reInvent. And uh, later on, I read in some analyst uh, commentary online that this is definitely the influence of Adam Slipsky, as he just simply doesn't like it, and he also has instructed others not to do it. Adam really took his time during his keynote for storytelling, and this is especially different from uh, other years where there was a really high velocity rate of keynote uh, announcements uh, uh, that we've seen in previous years. In fact, there weren't that many announcements in the keynote uh, at all. If I have to come up with one area of improvement for him, I would suggest that he would engage a little bit more with the audience. I mean, there's about 20,000 AWS fanboys in the room and that potential energy was left rather unused. So all in all, I think we've seen more spectacular keynotes although the messaging of this keynote was pretty much all right. And that message was all about AWS no longer wanting to be seen as, let's say, the general purpose infrastructure provider. I mean, all the services are there. There's like 200 something of them, but in this case, the sum is bigger than its parts. To me, this seems to represent that AWS is shifting from merely offering infrastructural primitives to embracing this idea of being a platform of platforms. And therefore, it becomes a very interesting piece in the value chain of every organization leveraging them. And when you think about this, is it, this is largely the same strategy as we see with Amazon.com in retail. Right? So they try to be in every transaction between every buyer and seller online. 
So thinking about it is not such a great, uh, some, not such a strange idea uh, after all. Reinvent 2021 also marked 10 years of AWS Reinvent and also uh, 15 years of AWS itself. And even though at the age of 15, you're not yet considered to be a grown up, and AWS itself would definitely proclaim it's still day one, we can say that they have built a pretty impressive platform uh, so far. One of the highlights of a typical reInvent week is definitely the keynote of Dr. Werner Vogels. It's always highly anticipated for its, well, witty insights, uh, his cool one-liners, and sometimes interesting surprises, like driving a truck on stage, for example, a few years ago. And our expectations were easily satisfied with a very cool opening video of Werner living the fear and loathing in Las Vegas movie. But further down the line, it wasn't as spectacular as we had hoped for, uh, which is actually a good thing, because for a platform that is now 15 years old, you don't expect big surprises every year. While not spectacular, it was certainly very good though, in terms of really making a case for well-architected applications. And this seemed to be a theme uh, for a number of years now in Werner's keynotes. One of the topics which was uh, quite prominent during Werner's keynote was the uh, CDK Patterns Library, which was conceived by Matt Coulter of uh, Liberty Mutual. And he even got an award for that on stage. And Kamal will talk a little bit more about um, uh, CDK uh, later on in this presentation. Now, by talking about well-architected and by talking about CDK, we have now automatically transitioned to the next part of this session, where we take a look at AWS as a cloud-native development platform. So, you can look at AWS in a few different ways. You can see them as the data center at the other end of the internet. You can see them as a bunch of computers at the other end of the, of the internet. You can see them as a bunch of cheap or maybe not so cheap data storage at the other end of the internet. Or you just see them as a huge bunch of infrastructural primitives. The way we look at AWS at Luminous is by categorizing their services or as one of three cloud categories. First, there's IaaS or infrastructure as a service. And these are your basic infrastructural primitives that you would normally need to build a data center, like storage, networking, compute. Then there is a second category called PaaS or platform as a service, which are more middleware oriented services. These services are typically uh, used to build applications on top of infrastructure. And here you should think of web servers, databases, message queues, and so on. The third and final category breaks a bit with the as a service naming paradigm, and it's called serverless. With serverless, you focus on the functional value that a given service provides without worrying at what is needed to run it. In the words of the pets versus cattle example, this is where we focus on the produce instead of the individual animal. A serverless service is easily compared to taking electricity from the wall socket. You only take it when needed and you only pay for it when you actually use it. When serverless was first introduced, it was largely synonymous with AWS Lambda, uh, which is now known as functions as a service. But uh, apart from having serverless compute, we now also have serverless middleware and even some serverless infrastructural components. And Pete will talk more about this later on. Taking these three categories together, they make up the 200 plus services in the AWS portfolio. Like Werner would say, well, you asked for it, but how do you know where to start when you want to build an application. Now, let me think about it. I'm a big fan of Lego. In fact, I picture everything as Lego. So visualizing these categories of cloud services as Lego, I come up with three collections of Lego pieces. 
the first collection is the Lego collection of my father. You see it on the left-hand side. Because Lego was around since the, well, as we know it, as the, uh, since the 1950s, uh, last century. My father used to play with Lego as he was a kid. And those pieces are still compatible with the Lego bricks that we have today. However, those pieces were pretty coarse-grained. They are functional, but limited, and only available in a very select set of colors. The second collection of Lego pieces is my own collection. It's the one in the middle. And this collection started when I was a child and offers quite a few more functional pieces. It also has a lot more variance in both shape and color. The third and final collection of Lego pieces is that of my children. Those pieces are really nice and shiny. There are many variants in both shape and color and pieces have become a lot more functional too. Now revisiting this question of where to start, when I have to build something uh, in Lego these days, I will always start from that third collection. This is where I like to look first. It offers me a lot of functionality out of the box, almost to a point where I don't need anything else to build whatever I can think of. However, sometimes I don't have all the pieces um, or somehow something is still missing or the build becomes too complex or too advanced. In that case, I can resort to my own collection and start adding some extra pieces to the build. In case I can't find it there, then, only then, I will resort to the collection of my father and add in the missing pieces. Now, this is exactly how we look at cloud development at Luminous. We start building from the most modern collection first. We call this serverless first. And the end result is often a fully serverless solution these days, or a composite solution existing of as much serverless functionality as possible and then complemented with pieces from the other collections only when needed. Please bear in mind though that LEGO is producing more and more kits these days. So new pieces with new functionality become available and are being added regularly. And it's the same with cloud. So AWS is releasing new services or service enhancement regularly. And therefore, this current collection of building blocks is still growing. And so it pays to revisit your current builds uh, or your already built applications every now and then. And you will see that more and more bricks from the older collections can be replaced with new pieces. And the end result is that your builds become more advanced, more functional, and also oftentimes more or cheaper. Now bear in mind that cheaper does not always mean less money in terms of total cost of ownership, but at least it means like less money up front. So by making the cloud or the cloud vendor in this case uh, do more in return for your money, you are getting more value from the cloud. And having all these pieces or building blocks available in your toolbox also allowed for both easier and faster experimentation. So um, less money up front means that you have this pay-as-you-go uh, scheme. And having all these tools in your toolbox means that it's easy, uh, easier to experiment. And um, having the ability to for both easier and faster experimentation well, that's what we call innovation these days. At the same time, cloud is democratizing the technology landscape by making all this cool technology available to everyone. And it doesn't matter whether you're a small startup or a huge enterprise, everything is available to you. And well, the only limit basically is the limit of your credit card. And like I've said in many presentations before this one, serverless is really changing the way we've regarded the cloud so far. So let's pass it on to Pete, who is going to talk more about the ongoing evolution of serverless at AWS. Pete, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you, Bert. 
uh, well, like Brett said, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two things. Uh, the first one is serverless, and after that, I'm going to talk about event-driven systems. Okay, so um, let's take a look at this man for a moment. Uh, for me, this photo embodies what serverless is. You see here a person that is 100% focused on creating the best cup of coffee that you ever had. And what he's not doing right now is milking cows, or roasting beans, getting water from a well, or burning coal or wood to get electricity going, because he needs focus to create the best coffee you have ever had in your life. And to me, that's what serverless is in a nutshell. It's about not having to manage all these things that don't differentiate you from your competitor. Um, and serverless is therefore not just functions or Lambda or S3, it's about focusing on value for your customer. And to have a look, to, to see how we got here, uh, I'm going to do a short history lesson. So uh, a few years ago, or maybe uh, ages ago in terms of technology, we had uh, on-premise data centers where you had to manage, scale uh, everything that was uh, that you see on the left of your screen. So you have the hardware, which you had to provision and install. You had to uh, install a virtualization layer and manage it, OS. Maybe when you had containers and you still had a data center, you had to manage those too. And everything on top of that, up until the application, you had to manage yourself. And like Beth just said, uh, then EAS, Infrastructure as a Service, came along and everything changed. You no longer had to manage the hardware or the virtualization layer. You had to scale the OS layer uh, and everything on top of that, you, could, you had to manage yourself and scale yourself. Then containers as a service came along where you could deploy your, deploy your containers and the next evolution was PaaS, platform as a service. And where we are now is beyond functions as a service. We are in the ages of serverless. And serverless has several benefits for us as developers. And the main one for me is getting to the market faster because you don't have any operational overhead. Like the, the man you just saw, you can just focus on creating value. In our case, you focus on creating an application or a landscape of applications. And you can release quickly, which means you get feedback from your customers quickly, which you can iterate upon again. That's innovation. A nice benefit of serverless is that you can lower your cost. So you, if you do it well, you pay for value, you pay as you go, um, and you, your resources, which you won't see because you don't have to manage them, are automatically optimized and there's no uh, over-provisioning because if you can scale down, if you have to scale down, the cloud will do that for you. Scaling up and down is, happens like magic. You can scale from zero to huge numbers of instances of your application parts uh, on demand, and you can adapt to success or failure or maybe slow times really fast without having to pay for stuff you don't need. All in all, that means that you can now focus on creating value, like I just said. It, be it has become easier, you have time freed up, you have the mental model uh, of uh, creating an application, creating value, and that's what you focus on. That's what serverless gives us. Um, and AWS have several, has created several building blocks for that over the years, and you can divide them up into three categories, I think. So, um, when we talk about serverless, people often think immediately about the compute parts that serverless consists of, like Lambda or maybe Fargate. But data store can also be serverless. We have DynamoDB, where you don't have to manage a global scale database. We have S3, where you have a global scale object store. And we even have serverless SQL um, service these days. And to integrate these parts, there's a huge amount of application integration services like EventBridge, SQS, SNS, API Gateway, AppSync, and Step Functions. So let's do another history lesson. 
let's see how serverless is evolving, has evolved, and still is evolving. Um, in the old days, .NET and Java promised what AWS promises us now. We can focus on writing code that transforms and not transports, e.g. write business logic, and serverless is just the next evolution of that. It's not about applications, it's about programming everything you need to deploy value for your users. So if we take the AWS command line, one of the things we could always do, or at least from the beginning of AWS, is deploy uh, containers, or sorry, virtual machines, EC2 instances. We could deploy databases with a single line, and later on, we could create Lambda functions. So we are going from programming applications to programming infrastructure and even integrations. You can create an event bus with a click of a button or with one single line of code, and you can publish events that you can respond to in your application landscape. And amazingly, what you can also do now is get data that you didn't uh, collect yourself from a powerful set that someone else manages for you with a single API call and even satellite data. <coughs> so here you see the power of serverless. Everything is just one click or one API call away. There weren't a lot of serverless um, announcements this year at reInvent. I've highlighted a few. Uh, the most important ones for me are um, the announcements of MSK becoming serverless, the managed uh, uh, Apache Kafka service that AWS has, where you only pay for the data you stream and retain. You don't no longer have to manage the underlying infrastructure and applications. Same goes for EMR, for your big data applications. EMR has now become very easy and cost-effective for data engineers and analysts and you can easily run petabyte scale, petabyte scale data analytics in the cloud. Redshift has also become serverless, um, where you can run analytics at any scale without having to manage a data warehouse uh, infrastructure. Kinesis is serverless now as well, um, where you can easily stream uh, data, capture, process, and storm the data at any scale. And like I just mentioned, there's now a data exchange API where you can easily um, get data that someone else collected and use it for your applications. Lambda had some announcements. There's now ephemeral storage in pre-announcement where you can use uh, from 512 MB to 10,000 of ephemeral storage in your temp directory. There are par there's now the functionality of partial batch responses for SQS, where you only retain the messages that could not be successfully processed. So you no longer have to reprocess and uh, split those up yourselves. Um, so this improves the performance of your application. And for MSK users, there is now a new uh, uh, metric offset lag. And the last announcement that is noteworthy is step functions which are now integrated with Athena console, which you can see here. And for, my, for me, this is a prime example of the power of serverless. So now you can program your Athena workflows using step functions, and by seeing your logic displayed visually, you free up so much mental space compared to using code that you now have some extra brain power left to focus on creating value, to think about what you want to build for your customers. And now the question has become, what is programming? Is that just application development, functional logic? Uh, is it also maybe programming what operations did before? So this line between application and operation or automation code is blurring, uh, thanks to the power of cloud APIs. You don't have to take this from me. Uh, last week, Gregor Hope drew the same conclusion. Um, so he agrees that uh, with the power of AWS, you can now program anything from application code to satellite data. Okay, so that's serverless. <coughs> now let's go 
and look at the evolution of event-driven event -driven architecture in AWS. So I've talked about serverless and the underlying superpower of serverless in my opinion is that it's event-driven. But what is an event-driven architecture? Um, from a functional point of view, uh, event-driven architectures are agile architectures. So you have these subsystems with clear boundaries and solid contracts where you can hide implementation details as long as your communication is defined well. That means that as a, a programmer or as a creator of applications, you can focus on behavior and not on the structure of your applications. You also tend to, uh, are going to think more about data um, in a temporal sense. So you don't think in structures and static moments in time, but in behavior and data through time within a business domain. And the main components of an event-driven architecture are event producers, the stuff that produces events that you can react on, event consumers that consume these events and maybe produce events themselves, and the lines between the boxes, which are the event routers. There are several types of event-driven systems. Uh, Martin Fowler uh, describes four ones. Uh, an example is event notification systems, where you decouple parts of your system uh, by using messaging, um, which enables you to decouple your architecture and be ultra flexible. The hard part of an event-driven system in this sense is that you don't have an overall statement of behavior. So in the old world, we created applications, monoliths, on our computers that we could control and oversee completely. Event-driven systems are more complex in that sense. Then there's stuff like CQRS and event sourcing systems. And according to Craig Young, CQRS is a stepping stone towards event sourcing systems which are also complex, but very powerful. So what are the benefits of using event-driven systems? Like I said, a major component of this is decoupling. So if you use an event-driven architecture, you can integrate a fairly heterogeneous application landscape by sharing information without coupling parts of your application. So you can scale, develop, evolve parts of your infrastructure without having to integrate or wait on the rest of the system or the landscape to evolve with you. Another important benefit is scalability. You can, uh, for example, do massive parallel processing if you set up your applications correctly. Uh, you can scale out horizontally easily, for example, by um, having multiple types of consumers process the same event, which gives you agility, uh, not just in your um, infrastructure and your logic, but in your uh, functionality. So you could, could do polling, filtering, and routing without having to code and without having to do heavy coordination. All the parts of your systems are now fairly independent of each other, which means you can scale them as you please without having to coordinate with the rest. And you can also fill in isolation. And if you fill, then the event router, the stuff between the boxes, is your buffer. Another benefit is auditability. If you store all the events coming into the system, then you have a system of record of what the system is processing. And you centralize routing, which, mean, which means you can create policies and control who has inf insight into your events and data. And the last one is frugality, because if you're doing event-driven systems in the cloud, then you are not wasting any idle resources. And if you don't do continuous polling, then you're only responding when you need to, and not using any infrastructure. And like I said before, event-driven architectures are very powerful, but they are also very complex. Like you see here, um, these are three tweets of uh, fairly big names. 
uh, Werner Vogels there has an image of the uh, microservice architecture of AWS in I think 2008, uh, which they named the Dead Star. Um, and Netflix, Twitter, and other companies that were uh, early adopters of these kinds of architectures also had really complex infrastructure, but also really powerful infrastructure. So event-driven is powerful, but it's also complex. You need to learn how to manage this chaos. So, why do we think that the future of our field is event-driven? Um, to prove this, sort of, I want to tie this back to the benefits. So, um, if you want to scale hugely um, and share information quickly and scale up uh, and uh, be very agile in your architecture and your business, then uh, the thing you have to aim for is time to value. That's become the most important metric. So if you want to be agile in the business, then your architecture has to be agile as well. And since the world around us is speeding up its rate of change, then our architecture is probably also heading in that direction. So if you want to be agile in your business, you have to be agile in your architecture, and you'll probably end up someday, if you don't already do this, with an event-driven architecture. Now, why is the cloud event-driven? So like Jeff Bezos says here, the only uh, sustainable advantage you have as a business over others is agility, that's it. If you come up with an invention or an innovation today, someone else will copy that in a few days, weeks, or months. And then your slight advantage is gone. So the only advantage you have is being more agile than your com competitors. And like I said before, the most agile architecture in our opinion is an event-driven architecture. And since uh, AWS and other cloud providers are very customer obsessed and are always running ahead of demand, or trying to run ahead of demand, they are probably going to run towards this direction. So if you do event-driven architecture in the cloud, then you're probably set for the, the, uh, for the coming years. Okay, what does AWS provide us then to build these event-driven architectures? So I think there are four categories here that are notable. Um, there are some producers or services like um, uh, the AWS services themselves or maybe a custom SaaS application uh, or a microservice architecture you already have that you can use to produce events. They can be consumed by, for example, uh, Lambdas or SQS uh, and SNS or a Kinesis uh, data firehose, and then route it to the rest of your infrastructure by using EventBridge or SNS. And to help you set up these architectures in a proper way, uh, you can use the best practices as defined in the AWS Well Architected Framework, or you can use the Well Architected tool to see how you're doing in this sense. Uh, let's highlight EventBridge here. I think that EventBridge bridge is a great example of the continued investment AWS makes into providing us with event-driven building blocks. So EventBridge was introduced in mid-2019 for building powerful event-driven applications at scale. And since its launch, a lot of things have been added, like schema registry, archive and replaying of events, cross-event uh, bus target support, API destinations for any HTTP API and more. There's a long list of destinations for EventBridge and you can do uh, pattern matching, filtering and routing of your events fairly easily without having to code it yourself. So that's an incredibly powerful and flexible component of your event-driven architecture that's continuously evolving. There were some uh, notable event-driven uh, reinvent announcements. Uh, the first one for EventBridge, like I said, there were some um, announcements uh, on 
S3, uh, which you, uh, sorry, um, where you could quickly now uh, react to changes to S3 objects. So you don't have to wire that yourself anymore. You can just respond to it using event bridge, which gives you uh, a way to evolve your applications a little faster. Lambda. Lambda now has, uh, can, you can do filter, uh, filtering of incoming, incoming messages before in function invocations. So you don't have to do it yourself either anymore. And you can use the same rules as event bridge as there. And lastly, from left, AWS IoT Twin Maker, a new IoT service that helps developers create digital rep representations of real world systems. Okay, now, Kamal, I hand this over to you and you can do developer experience. Thanks, Pete. Hello again, everyone. So I'm going to talk about recent AWS improvements on the developer experience. So it will be less about architectures or concepts. Uh, it will be more about what we use daily, more about AWS services. So developer experience term is self-explanatory, but shortly it is what we feel when we develop software products. And of course, nobody wants to use bad products or have bad experience. Us developers, engineers, we want to use the best and most efficient tools to deliver best software products. And if we can do that, users and the business people will be also happy. So it is in a way affecting all of us, not only developers. And my experience uh, with this topic is that I use other cloud providers time to time, and I feel experience is the most significant difference between AWS and the other cloud providers. And AWS is the clear leader in the cloud industry when it comes to our experience. And every year, AWS improves developer experience in multiple ways. For the recent reInvent, we can group them into four topics. First is we see increased development speed. Uh, latest services help us develop faster and deliver software faster. Second is even though AWS offers more and more services every year, they keep decreasing the complexity. We see that thanks to some new services, we have more straightforward ways of realizing our product ambitions and going to market. Third, we can do now do more with the same amount of resources through optimizations. So AWS is becoming more efficient. And lastly, and most importantly, sustainability. We live in strange times. The climate crisis is real and we also have energy crisis, so we need to uh, rethink about what we use and how much we use. So we are happy to see that AWS is taking steps towards uh, having a more sustainable cloud. And as we can understand from these four topics, the cloud is getting more mature. Instead of offering many new services, AWS is focusing on doing things better, faster, and easier. And let's continue with our first focus, increasing the development speed. Again, if we are faster and more agile, we can ship software quicker and innovate more. So this means more success when we are developing products. And how AWS is facilitating this? Firstly, by the developer tooling, we have more intelligent ways of using cloud. Almost everybody these days uh, use infrastructure as code but we are now moving towards more and more infrastructure is code these days and uh, we use cloud development kits, CDKs, and they are becoming more and more popular. And the second is related to the first one. When we use CDKs, cloud development kits more, our infrastructure code is becoming more shareable and we can use the power of abstractions and instead of copy-pasting YAML, JSON, or HCL. Uh, we use CDK libraries, packages, constructs, and we can share it with uh, anybody. It's really easy these days. And uh, the next is we have faster feedback thanks to the automation provided by AWS. 10 years ago, we had to do a lot by ourselves, but thanks to 
the recent cloud services, we can use uh, many out of the box features, which, has, which let us know what we can improve or fix. And uh, another, uh, we have fast, uh, sorry, we have a significant improvement on the monitoring. Thanks to CloudWatch, we have multiple uh, new features. And also we get a new community support tool this year. And this is my favorite topic, uh, Cloud Development Kits. And uh, these are not AWS service op offerings by itself, but uh, these are community-driven projects, except AWS CDK is led by AWS. As you know, AWS CDK was showcased uh, on re reInvent 2018, three years ago. And uh, this year, it was announced that we, we are having the second version, it is right now at general availability stage, and we see significant improvements from version one. So right now, AWS CDK is a monolithic package, so we don't need to import different packages per service, and this provides us easier dependency management, and uh, we won't be wasting a lot of time uh, configuring those dependencies. And uh, with version two, uh, the tool is more stable. We don't get experimental uh, modules anymore. Uh, of course, we can still use them, but we need to import them separately. And we are also getting rid of deprecated stuff, properties, classes, modules, so whatever we see on CDK, uh, we can use it without much thinking. And uh, also bootstrapping is improved. Uh, we now have modern bootstrapping by default. And the last one, uh, I think the best one, is the watch mode. So it's like hot swapping in Java or programming languages or frameworks. So as we write our infrastructure code, watch mode uh, automatically deploys our infrastructure as we save the file. And this really increases the development speed. And it is great to see your changes immediately deployed on the cloud. In general, I feel like V2 is uh, more straightforward and faster. And as you see, we also have two other CDKs, CDK for Terraform, CDK PF, and also CDK for Kubernetes uh, CDKs. We can right now use them, but they are still in progress. They are not uh, at the general availability stage, but they are emerging like AWS CDK. Let's continue with the relevant one, Construct Hub. Uh, it is also at the general availability stage. What is Construct Up? It's a place where you can find open source cloud development kit libraries and packages for all three uh, cloud development kits. When we need a construct, we, we can go to Construct Hub and search through cloud constructs instead of writing them from scratch or looking from different uh, websites. And also, if you want, we can share our packages with the community, which is really nice. And some other improvements that us develop faster are one on ECR, Elastic Container Registry. Our public images can now automatically be synchronized from publicly accessible registries, thanks to pull through cache repositories. And we don't need to do this by ourselves anymore. So the other two ones are about CloudWatch. We have a new feature called Real User Monitoring, and this helps us understand our users better. And second for CloudWatch, Metrics Insights. So it's a SQL-based query engine. Uh, an example can be uh, we can write an SQL query to get average CPU utilization for a specific group of instances. So it is uh, easy to play with metric data using metric insights. And the last is on AWS CodeGuru. The service was announced two years ago, so it's uh, one of the newer services. The way it works is you associate your repository and then it comes up with uh, suggestions like an, uh, a team member, but an automated one. And now it can also detect uh, secrets in the source code, it can be 
passwords, API keys, SSH keys, or access tokens, and also helps us creating a secret from that. Now, automations like these let us get feedback faster and improve the code right away. And lastly, uh, we set a new community uh, support tool. Uh, it is called AWS Repost. It's a new Q&A service for AWS. Well, actually, it's not really a new service because it was an internal tool used by Amazon employees. But right now, it can be used by us, anybody, for free. And uh, we should check it. It's a really good knowledge base. And why is it becoming more important? Because first of all, other uh, apps like Stack Overflow are mostly for programming or library framework uh, focused. So sometimes it's not best place to ask questions about the cloud. We also add AWS forms, but uh, AWS forms uh, will discontinue from starting from 1st of April and become read-only mode. Instead, uh, forms will be merged into AWS repost. So it will be the single place, new single place, everything about AWS, correct answers to our questions. And we can also join different AWS communities there. Our second focus is uh, AWS improves developer experience by simplification and flexibility. Why having uh, less complexity is important because AWS these days offer more than 200 uh, fully featured services and the number uh, keeps increasing every month. And uh, we lost the track. I personally don't know the exact number I looked for uh, before this meetup, but couldn't find it. So it is uh, becoming more difficult to follow the news about those services or uh, follow the new uh, feature announcements and learn about everything. So it is not like five, 10 years ago. It's impossible to know everything. And therefore AWS tries to simplify things while offering more and more. So we are not drowning in the ocean of services and features. So more flexibility, but with less complexity. And how does AWS do that? We already talked about serverless. Besides that, we have uh, more low code and no code offerings. The, these topics are becoming more popular. And because not every user is an uh, application developer, so those people might not have the best programming knowledge. And these kind of, we have more automation to help developers. So we don't need to do it all. We can rely on AWS more, which also simplifies things. And finally, uh, we have some new features. Let us do the same things, but uh, in a different way. So we have more nice to have options. First, uh, about uh, a no-code tool called uh, Amazon SageMaker Canvas. It's for the people who don't know much about machine learning, but still want to use, uh, have predictions over their data. So it's a nice uh, visual interface to generate machine learning predictions. So it uh, involves no coding. You only need to import your data and with, in, with few customizations on the prediction model, uh, you can have your results. And another exciting tool called AWS Amplify Studio. It's a visual development environment to build apps. We provide uh, our data, custom front end, uh, sorry, customize front end, and we use drag and drop features and Amplify generates the code for us. Then we can check and modify the code. So we have both uh, visual environment to build our apps and also the code, the project. So that is why it's a low code offering. We have the following new features, help us simplify things and do things in a more straightforward way. To decouple applications, we usually 
use SQS and managing unconsumed messages in the DLQ can be pain sometimes. So with the new feature, that letter Q management, we can redrive re the messages easier and we have to do less work. The, ne the next thing is about uh, cloud migrations. So we do a lot of uh, workload migration projects, of course, and we can for, for this we can use AWS Migrations Hub. And uh, it has new feature called refactoring, uh, refactor spaces, and we get reduced time to set up uh, a refactor environment. And AWS accelerates migration by simplifying app management and deployments while we refactor our apps. Another interesting one, SageMaker Studio Lab. Uh, it's a free machine learning uh, tool, so anybody can use and code machine learning freely. And we have more software development kits for Swift, Kotlin, and Rust developers. And thirdly, our focus area is optimization. So we can do uh, more and better with the same amount of resources, or we can even use less resources. So we see more and more companies are going mature and uh, with their cloud, cloud usage and getting more cloud native. So performance improvements or cost optimization are crucial topics these days. And AWS helps us uh, do more with less in multiple ways. One is uh, we can spend less with the new instance times types and we can have better performance. Second is we can get suggestions for optimizing our cloud usage. And some other improvements that helps us uh, do more with less, so increased efficiency. We are not going to spend a lot of time uh, on the new instance types because most of the time we check those instance types when we need them. But of course, uh, we see that the new instance types uh, use the latest processors, mostly AWS's Graviton 2 and 3 processors. So they are both uh, better in performance and they are cheaper. So if you don't have any dependencies, uh, it is wise to switch to these new instance types. And very shortly, the most interesting one is M1, new N1 Mac instances for Mac OS. They are built on Apple Silicon Mac mini computers and also using uh, AWS microsystems. Uh, it provides up to 60% performance compared to x86 uh, based Mac instances. Next is AWS Compute Optimizer. We can get recommendations for EBS volumes, lambdas, or EC2 instances. And it tells if our resources are under-provisioned or over-provisioned and says how much we can uh, save by downsizing or the other way, how much we should provision. So, and also which instance type is the best. And the service now has resource efficiency metrics. And so we have more facts about computing resources. And as a result, it's easier to uh, decide how and when to optimize. And a few other uh, improvements. One is about mainframes. And uh, for many enterprises, as you know, mainframe is still a thing. It's the heart of their business, like uh, finance companies, banks. And therefore, AWS announced a new service called mainframe modernization. And it helps us uh, modernize our workloads on the mainframe and move them to cloud. And a treat for .NET developers, microservice extractor for .NET. And it simplifies uh, refactoring .NET applications uh, into independent services. 
finally another CloudWatch feature called Evidently and it is for feature flags and A-B testing. Our last focus uh, on developer experience is sustainability, which is about making cloud more environmentally friendly. And there were many sessions at reInvent 2021 on this topic. Uh, three years ago, AWS co-founded uh, the Climate Pledge, which is a commitment to be net carbon, uh, net zero carbon across their business by 2040. So it's 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. And Amazon is a path uh, to powering its operations with 100% renewable energy by 2025. So uh, if you think of it, it will happen in three and a half years and we will be using AWS and it will be on 100% renewable energy. And I believe this is one of the most fantastic uh, news from the event. And also AWS gave us a teaser for a new tool called Customer Carbon Footprint Tool. We don't know much about it yet, but still, as the name suggests, uh, we will be able to uh, calculate our carbon footprint and this will help us get more conscious decisions when using cloud infrastructure. And as a result, we will try to use less resources. And finally, uh, another exciting news, uh, we have we had five pillars for well-architected framework. Uh, but right now uh, it is announced that we will have a sixth one. So sustainability will be the new one. So therefore, when we have reviews for our workloads to uh, see about the improvements, we will also think about sustainability and work towards having more sustainable workloads and cloud. This was all about the developer experience. And uh, we have a raffle for you. You can go to this URL and enter your name and email address. And we have two prizes for you. One is a jacket. You can win this uh, limited edition reinvents 10th year anniversary jackets which is, looks really nice and you can see the super fancy lego set uh, in the slide it's a lego globe which is interesting and uh, yeah you need to go to this url and then we have q a yay we use the mic Hello. So we can now watch uh, your questions live on a super tiny screen. Um, and if you don't come up with any questions, I can. Um, Beth, can you join me, please? So I was wondering, uh, Beth, if you uh, would have a, a crystal ball in which you could see uh, the future. Uh, what do you think uh, a possible future of our uh, cloud-driven um, into the mic apparently what do you think uh, the future uh, of our field will look like in the perspective of the cloud um, well let me dust off my crystal ball for a second um, I think a few of uh, I think parts of the answer is already given uh, during the presentation um, but like you said uh, we see lots and lots of value in becoming more and more serverless for obvious reasons uh, stated in the presentation and I think uh, decoupling stuff and using events at the heart of our architecture uh, is always uh, always the way to go forward. So combining the, these things and um, applying these to well the rest of this 200 something uh, services portfolio uh, will definitely the, uh, be the way forward uh, for the next couple of years, I would say. Uh, then, uh, like uh, like I mentioned in my part of the presentation. Uh, Werner Vogel stated, uh, you ask for this, right? So the current set of AWS services is really driven by uh, customer demand, as AWS and also Amazon always states. They are uh, completely customer obsessed. So um, uh, I think 
that we will see a number of interesting additions uh, to this portfolio as well. And I hope all of them will become uh, uh, even more serverless than they are uh, right now. This is definitely the direction uh, that the cloud will go uh, for the next couple of years. Okay. Thank you. Um, I see that our uh, friend Angelo has a question about the data exchange API. His question is, is it only intended for uh, open data sets? Or does it have a use for my own data? Um, I've been to a workshop uh, in Las Vegas on uh, the data exchange API. And from what I could tell and remember is that any company that um, can, uh, has a data set that could be valuable to other customers or customers of AWS can put their data in a sort of marketplace and they can determine um, or they can ask a price for the usage of their data. And um, then if you pay the price, uh, then you can uh, use that data uh, in your application. So it's not necessarily an open data set. There are also open data sets in there that are, that are free uh, to use. Um, but uh, the, the main use case I see is companies that uh, invest their money into getting data that could be valuable. So that's what they're good at. And then uh, companies or, or organizations that are good at creating new value from that data, so using that data as an actual asset, uh, and create uh, something that the other company doesn't have the budget or time or focus uh, uh, for. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah, that's what we saw. Um, before we answer the, the next question from Angelo, uh, Kamal, what was your favorite uh, announcement uh, this year at Reinfrain? Um. Yeah, I kind of said that, uh, sustainability. I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, the step that we should go uh, towards. So it is really looking forward for the uh, renewable energy part. 100% renewable energy sounds really interesting. And also the CDK part, uh, which the announcement that changed my daily life most. So I st already started using KWS CDK version 2 and really enjoy it. And uh, yeah, I think these two are the biggest ones. And you, for you? Um, well, for me, I, the thing I tried out first was the CDK watch functionality, yeah, yeah. which uh, works uh, great. Um, and I also am a fan of uh, AWS Amplify, so I used to, uh, tried to use the new studio um, and try to uh, create an application uh, by just uh, clicking and dragging uh, an interface. So I think that's a really, Cool gateway uh, sort of drug into uh, AWS. Um, okay, uh, I thought Angelo had another question. Um, he asked, "AWS services are becoming more uh, AWS services becoming serverless are potentially very interesting. What are the catches? Is it cost prohibitive for real world volumes? Do we need to uh, worry about warm up times?" Anyone? Yeah. Very nice. Let me take this one. This is one of my favorite questions. Oh, actually, it's two questions, right? Uh, so the answer to the first question, and you can already guess it, it, it depends, right? As it is, that's the, that's the right answer uh, to, well, to, to all of your architectural questions. It depends. And um, so, uh, uh, like we mentioned, uh, stuff being more serverless also means we can do easier experimentation. And so this is definitely the first thing that you should do. So uh, work out some proof of concept and then start tinkering with it and see what kind of volumes uh, you actually uh, um, uh, tend to do, and then see how that works out uh, with the uh, serverless solution that you have. The good thing about stuff being serverless is you can build whatever you want. As long as you don't use it, you don't pay for it. You're not wasting any resources. So this is, uh, this is um, uh, really easy to experiment with. It highly depends on your use case whether the serverless variant of what you're trying to build is going to be cheaper in terms of total cost of ownership or it's going to be more expensive. The good news is that if it's going to be more expensive along the way, you are already in a stage where you are um, creating value and you are making money, hopefully, right? So as soon as your customers start to use your functionality, you're probably making money and using that money, you can pay the operational cost uh, of your uh, uh, functionality. Of course, uh, uh, like I mentioned, uh, new components are coming out every day, new optimizations, new features are coming out. So maybe something which is not feasible uh, today uh, will be feasible uh, tomorrow or the week after. 
right? So this is something that it's, uh, that's open for experimentation. And I would say, uh, looking at the, uh, a lot of use cases out there, that serverless is really, really uh, used in production a lot. So uh, I think the answer in general is, uh, most things are definitely uh, feasible, uh, but you have to make sure that you uh, do your benchmarking right. Then coming back to, your, to the second part of the question, is do we need to worry about warm-up times? Now, um, uh, the answer to that is, I think, twofold. Uh, first off, it highly depends on the programming language that you're using, right? So um, if you're using a programming language that is interpreted on the go, um, you probably uh, are dealing uh, with uh, different warm-up times than uh, uh, if you have a, uh, a programming language which is just uh, compiled and uh, needs to be loaded and all the classes and your, all your framework need to be loaded. Frameworks is the second part of the question because if you load in 150,000 classes to run a simple function, it's not uh, going to be fast, right? So stripping everything off uh, to uh, bare bones is also a good idea. And then uh, the third part uh, of the answer is uh, there's a lot of tinkering that can be done uh, with AWS uh, Lambda these days. So it's even possible to have like uh, warmed up instances uh, available. It's not really 100% serverless anymore, uh, but if it helps your use case, then it's definitely something that you can regard. Yeah, and um, uh, there are other services uh, that are also becoming more and more serverless, like uh, database services. And what we've noticed with, for example, Aurora becoming serverless is that on the one hand, it gets uh, much easier uh, or at least less expensive to develop something against that service. Um, but there are warm-up times or cold start times uh, were a problem for us. Um, but you see that on the one hand, AWS is working on uh, reducing those times there by uh, uh, having uh, things start up uh, faster and uh, having them become more granular. Um, so you could either wait for that or uh, implement something and put money uh, into uh, development of something that will circumvent this uh, limitation. Anyone? Uh, do you want to add something? No, I At think least that's summed up perfectly. Okay. Um, so we've proven that we are live now. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Do you have some questions for ourselves? Okay. Then uh, I think uh, we're wrapping up. Then uh, thanks everyone for attending our uh, live reinvent recap, not a rehash. And uh, we hope to see you soon uh, in our channel. Uh, have a nice evening and see you soon. Bye-bye.